It's a guy, a car, and a podcast. 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 Buckle up. October 2003, and I went with the girl who would eventually be my wife, now my ex-wife. Um, it must have been like a year later, so it must have been like 05. So yeah, you went to one, you went like right away, to one of the first ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, Cause that one's did you talk to him or did you just see him? Yeah, at that? talk to him. Bring oh, okay. Him. Yeah, because I, I pulled him outside when I saw him because he and I hadn't talked since he went home, and I was just like, talk to me, Goose. And he's just, I mean, he's not, at the time, he wasn't very emotional. He was just like, I'm good. Oh, yeah, he, seemed right, like, he was in real good spirits. He was, in, <laughs> he was happy and having fun. And... But the last I met yesterday, different human being. Like, sure. Really, um, just humbled by his own post-mission, you know, mistakes, and just how he went pretty, based on, you know, just the, kind of the social backlash Mm -hmm. of having come home early and what have you, like, he got ostracized, and so he just ran, he was just, just, forget this, and went and did whatever, and so, he tells the story, like, eventually, I don't know if you're going to listen to any podcast or watch his documentary, but he tells the story in vivid detail, I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to get as much of it in the documentary as possible, but the podcast is going to be unedited, it's just everything he said is so good. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, that's a big frustration of mine, how we, or how the culture of the church pe- treats people who come home early. My brother came home early for medical reasons, mm-hmm. and he, I mean, he didn't see quite as much, but he did still feel some of that rejection, like he wasn't good enough. It's weird how it's maybe not exactly the same, but it's similar. Like, if, if there's something about the fact that you didn't fill your whole mission, like, it's, there's some... It's, it's frustrating to see. Yeah. Or even, like, church service different. missionaries or whatever. Like, if you didn't go out on a full-time, away from home, especially for, like, you and me. I mean, I, I talked to Lost a little bit about this, but, like, to be sent to a stateside English-speaking mission... Like, when I first got that call, because I'd gone through a lot of, like, church discipline and what have you, just to even get to the point where I, you know, was given a mission call, so I was grateful for it uh-huh. in that regard. But my dad went to Mexico City, Spanish-speaking. My brother went to Jamaica. They don't have, it's English, but Patois is not English. Like it's a, And I got called, like, to, in my opinion, the most, like, vanilla mission in the world. Yeah, it kind and, of is. <laughs> I and mean, at the time, I was like, okay, I'll go, but it definitely didn't sound, it wasn't sexy. I'm like, I'm, these yeah. aren't going to be stories yeah. that are going to wow the crowds at church meetings and stuff. And I, I want, I mean, did you go oh, yeah. through something similar? Oh, yeah, definitely. You, you, you grew up thinking you're going to go on this really exciting, exotic mission. You're going to go to some place <laughs> really cool, like, you know, where your ancestors were from or something like that. And, you know, you have these, you have these dreams of doing that, and then you open it up and... Pittsburgh. Like my first thought was actually, wait a minute, I can't go to Pittsburgh because Stanquist is going to Pittsburgh. Stanquist is already in Pittsburgh. I can't go to the same mission as my buddy from down the street. <laughs> <laughs> but then I, you know, I kind of. Did that actually happen? I don't recognize that name. Was there somebody? Stanquist. Dave Stanquist. But he was there. Yeah, and he was my <laughs> companion for three months, and it was a disaster. <laughs> like, you know, we we hung out like every day <laughs> you know and, and my best friend lived next door to him so all, yeah. of, all of our friends in the ward we were we were hanging out every single day um, <laughs> and so I thought there's no way I can do that I, I can't go to the same place and then when we got called to be companions I thought okay this is going to be cool 
It was terrible. <laughs> it was so bad. <laughs> I haven't seen him or talked to him since he came home, which was like, I don't know, six or eight months before I did. Wow. I guess there is something to be said about, it's one thing to be social with somebody and just go out and do whatever you want. You watch movies, you... I don't know, burn down huts in the, in the yeah. desert or whatever. Get in trouble. But it's a whole other thing to be like, all right, every single day that we wake up has a strict and stiff itinerary of like talking to people about essentially the same subject all the time. Like, that's and in, really and in a tiny studio apartment. Yeah. What area was it? Indiana. Yeah, then I didn't start there. It was part of the Greensburg zone. Okay. Um, I love that you're going to have a memory about this because Lost couldn't remember garbage about like what areas he's there doing all that. It was funny. I don't know if I still can name all of my companions, but there was a point where I could rattle them all off. And, and recently, within the last few years. <laughs> um, which is saying something because I had 21 companions. That's a lot. I think I only had like 10 or something. I well, that includes all of, all of you guys that were in the office with us for... A week. A minute. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like... I uh, forgot about that. That's... You and, and Crimin and uh, who else was with us for a short time? Walter was there with us uh, for yeah. a real brief time. And then it was... I was in another threesome for a real... For two weeks in Franklin uh -huh. with uh, Pullman and Salo. Because... Because Pullman's visa expired a week before the end of the transfer, so he had to go home. We're going to get to it, but I, I need to talk to you about Salo, because I feel like you're probably one of the only other people that knew him after I knew him, and I just, I got to understand that kid a little bit better well, than I do. Well, again, I only knew him for two weeks. Even so, I... And then we got double down. If, if the timeline's right, like, uh, uh, I, I don't know, we'll see. Maybe you'll have things to tell me that might soothe my soul, and maybe you won't, it doesn't matter, but... Um, I, I am curious about like trying to get each missionary that I talk to story as sequential as I can. Okay. So you got your mission call in do you remember what month it was? It was in uh first part of January, I think. And when did you report April. to the MTC? April eleventh. And you're from here, so it was just drive down. Well I was in Logan, but yeah, northern Utah. So okay. It's, it's an hour and a half. Okay. And your family went with you and Yeah. Did that whole thing. Yeah, did that <laughs> whole weird thing. Where they split the auditorium, like, on this side it's everyone who came by themselves, and on this side it's everyone who came with their families. Yeah. And they show you that video, whatever that is, and it's like, all right, here's the moment of truth. Everybody say bye. Yeah, and you're thinking, <laughs> oh, man, what have I done? Because <laughs> it's, you know, you're committed at that point. You can't, you can't really... <laughs> Turn around and walk back through the auditorium and go the other way again. No, I forget it. <laughs> this isn't for me. Like, because you don't want to, you don't want to look like, um, you don't want to look like a, a, you're afraid or, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're weak somehow, uh -huh. or somehow incapable of doing it. But you're all crying on the inside. Well, all yeah, of you are just I'm like, I'm barely holding it together right now. <laughs> Because I'm not sure what I'm about to do. In, like, a more <laughs> reverent way, it's totally the opening scene of Jarhead. Like, you're all just being lined up. And, or, no, uh, Full Metal Jacket, where you're all just being lined up and yelled at and not, like, confrontational right. ways. But right. did you, how did the MTC receive you? I get the feeling, like, you're just such an individual that they were just like, cut your hair, do something different. Like, yeah. Well, there was, there was a little bit of that, I think. Um, you know, because I've... Like this, this ring I've worn since I was in high school. I, I don't know why. It's just like it's. A, I don't remember when I got it. I don't remember where I got it. But it's just like a part of who I am for some reason. Yeah, and it, it's a silly thing. But you know, in, in the MTC, like you, you know, you can't wear any jewelry. You can wear a CTR ring. I don't even own a CTR ring. I don't think I've owned a CTR ring since I was in <laughs> junior high. So and I'm like, no, that's not happening. I'm not gonna. You know they want. They want to change you. They want conformity, and the problem is, missionaries are coming from all walks of life, from all ethnicities, from all everything. So, all arguably, you can't get experience, that. yeah, and, and personal experience and background, and, and even in the field. I mean, some missions you wear like togas, or you wear like you're fitting into the culture. So you can't have conformity. You can't but I just I wasn't having any of that. <laughs> yeah. 
And uh, but it was it. My MTC experience was made a little bit easier because one of my buddies from school, one of my buddies from high school, was um, in my MTC group. He went to a different mission. He went to what is it with your mission? It's just like all of your <laughs> young life, life came with you. <laughs> it was probably good, uh, at least in some regards. That that happened because because he and I were in the same room. You know, we bunked together. We got along great. That helped out a lot. Um, in that the emotional transition from yeah. like normal life to missionary life was yeah. rough for you, like too many rules, too much like. Um, and and he was sort of in the same mindset as I was. Like, okay. I know I have to conform to a certain level, but it's there's still me that's going to come out. Yeah. It's still going to be me, and we goofed around a lot. We got in trouble in some of our classes because we just joke around and screw around and, you know, shoot rubber bands at each other. Was there a point of your mission, <clears throat> and I guess my question is, did this point piss you off? Because I'm sure you had it, because we all did. When you got to the point of your mission where you realized that who you are is important to your missionary service, like you, you're not being sent out there to just be a cookie-cutter teacher. They sent Jake Golightly to go, like... Touch these people's lives. Like, did, was there a PC that was just like, why have I been trying so damn hard to be this thing when I was sent here because I'm me? I think, I think so. There, it was, I think it was in Brookline. So my second area. And I was only in my first area of Latrobe for six weeks. Wow. And that was a bad experience. <laughs> we can talk about that later. <laughs> <clears throat> but it was, it was the first, um, one of the first meetings I had with President Cameron where and he said, you know, I feel like you have these spiritual gifts and, and I feel like because of that, because of who you are as a person, that's why you were called here and you'll have some sort of effect on somebody. And you know, I don't know <clears throat> in retrospect, I don't know how much of that I believe at this point. But huh. then it was meaningful. And I thought, okay, maybe, you know, and I, I had some bracelet on that I was wearing, you know, just something. I remember that thing. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he was like, why do you wear that? I said, I don't know, it's just something that I like. It's just part of my personality. And he, he didn't say, well, you can't wear it. You can't do that. It was, well, you know, you are who you are, and that's okay. That's a testament to Scott Cameron. Like, that man... I feel like he tried to understand his missionaries on an individual basis, which is admirable, but I, I wonder if it might have, like, taken more of his energy and, and left him less to, um, to, to work with the mission as a whole. Like, he was just spending so much time loving us individually and I mean did you ever get like personal letters from him and stuff? Like I think he would I did. take a lot of time <laughs> to try to connect with us individually. It was great and I loved it and it missed him when he was gone, but when I just look back at what he was called to do, it's like poor man. It takes it certainly takes a special kind of individual to not just do it, but want to do it in the first place. Yeah. You know, especially with the Pittsburgh mission, right? Because he was coming in on the heels of, uh, what was his name? Cooney? Yes! When oh, I was heard that Pittsburgh oh, wow. party mission. Uh -huh. And, you know, you hear stories about the, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostates and all of these <laughs> other <clears throat> mission groups that were just out there to screw around. I forgot about that to this moment. Wow. <clears throat> so he had a lot of cleanup to do. In yeah. Place, in addition to all these new missionaries coming in, and all of the, the normal missionary and mission. Which now that I think about it, like, although, you know, we, we think about these missions as uh, a revelatory process, that, you know, it, it comes to the prophet or one of the quorum of the twelve to send whoever to wherever. In Cameron's case, he was pulled out of his employment to go on this mission. But I remember my dad um, joking around me when I got my call, and, and we were doing research and you know he, he I think he was the first one to be like your mission president was the associate dean of BYU law school like this guy's gonna whoop on you man yeah. and now that you mentioned it like based on what he was being sent into maybe that was intentional they, they need to get some order up in this beast yeah 
Well, I certainly had his hands full, and I would wager to say that you and I probably didn't help. <laughs> I feel like I was externally good. I, I, I don't, I, I mean, obviously I got a reputation later for stuff that actually didn't really have a whole lot to do with me other than I was present, but I feel like when others were around that liked to play around and liked to whatever, I feel like I would play into that because I really enjoyed it, and so I, I would get in trouble as an appendage to what was going on, but as me, myself, and the people were just like, oh, play Mike's fine, he's not going to stir anything up. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I know nobody has ever said this to me, but I have wondered if, if I had some of that same reputation. Really? Amongst other missionaries. Hmm. I, I mean, maybe it's because by the time I knew you, I was out like a year and and I'd gotten a feel for a lot of the missionaries that were in the mission, and I think I'd already started like compartmentalizing and being like, I, I know who I want to talk to, I know who. I guess is worth my time and who yeah. knows who they are and all that sort of thing. So anybody that might have been talking that stuff is probably not somebody I would have wanted to talk to anyway because they just they don't know what they're talking about. Like they don't know you clearly if that's their opinion. Well, I don't think it. If that perception did exist, I don't know that it was wholly undeserved because <laughs> you know I would have I would have probably would have argued it at the time and and resented that, but. That was probably fair. <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I don't know. I got. I got pretty chunky pretty early. <laughs> so I heard you right. You said your first day was Latrobe. You were only there six weeks, and you went right to Brookline. So Trek was your second companion. Third, actually. Oh, who was with you in Brookline before that? Um, Thompson, Jordan Thompson. I heard the name. Face isn't gonna come back to me. Was that uh, how long were you with him? Three months. Oh, jeez. How long were you trapped? Six weeks. Oh, and then Smart was there for the six weeks. Okay. <clears throat> wow. How did you... I mean, on the outside, it looked like you two got along in the sense that you two were both very strong individuals and neither were interested in, like, out-spotlighting the other. Like, you just occupied your own spaces and were fine with that. Like, is that accurate or was there... Treff and I? Yeah. Yeah, we got along great. And um, I don't think we butted heads at all. In fact, I he was one of the companions that I look back on um, positively. I, I, you know, I, I think Ryan's great. He was he was one of my favorites, even though it was such a short time. Yeah. But the best are always like that. Like when I was with Hancock, uh -huh. who's insane. It was just six weeks. <laughs> that was that was. I it needed to be that because I would have just I would have started getting drunk. Yeah, I'm kind of like screw this mission stuff. I don't yeah, care. it seems like the people you, this guy. <laughs> you, you get along with the best. You're with for the shortest time. Yeah. And the ones that you just struggle <laughs> not to not to beat on, you're with a lot longer. So, I mean, since, you know, your third companionship and when I when I showed up also led into my hardest companion. And and none of this is to um, you know, denigrate anybody. It, it's all just Sharing our memories and sharing our thoughts at the time, because the whole point of this is to try to try to tell the story of my mission, but try to talk to other people and just try to tell the story of being a missionary. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess humanize it a bit, because, you know, when you see these guys in white shirts and ties and smiles, it looks so conformist that you just start thinking that there's no, there's not a human there, there's just a guy who's playing a part. Well, that's certainly but, what you think before you're one of them. Yeah, right? exactly. You have that image of missionaries in your mind as you're, as you're a young man coming up in the church. Mm -hmm. And you want to be that in a weird way. You kind of don't even know what it is. Yeah, it's such a mysterious thing you definitely put that you're like, imagine me a missionary. Like, it's, ugh. Especially if you've had some interaction with one that you liked. Yes. At some point. Those are powerful ones, yeah. Um, and, I, and I certainly did uh, when I was in Arizona, when we were growing up. Oh, yeah? I don't know. I'm saying I knew you grew up in Arizona, but we're at Glendale. Huh? We, were, we lived in Phoenix, Glendale for like six years. Good times. Um, but there was one missionary that definitely made an impression on me when I was young. I again, I don't remember his name. Me neither. Yeah, I can sort of see some of their faces, but just their impact is indelible. It's, yeah. 
it's there. So anyway, my companion, I get transferred to the beach view. You're in Brookline with Trap, and I meet Kent Coombs for the first time. How? <laughs> how did, I, I, you you were were you so? <clears throat> he was there with you before I got there. I don't know who was his last companion. Who did I replace? Do you remember? Yes, I can see his face. I feel like he sent him home, like honorably. I, I feel like he. Elder he, Jensen, a tall guy, real tall guy. Heard of him? I don't think I, I knew him. Okay, <laughs> he was he was the nicest, funniest human being. Ever. He was great. <laughs> how how did that go? <laughs> With Coombs? Yeah. Um, I've always wondered if there's somebody that's just like nice enough and standoffish enough that he just never got triggered. So he was just oh no, he, would, he he definitely got triggered <laughs> constantly. Oh, uh, because Coombs was Coombs. I mean, yeah. And and Jensen handled it very well, but you you knew on P day that he was so grateful because we'd go there and do our laundry. Yeah. Uh, at that place across the street. Mm-hmm. And you knew, you could just see, like, when we would show up 9.30 or whatever in the morning, like, a certain amount of tension just leave his body. Uh, as yeah. if the stress that was Coombs was being spread around. Yes! That's exactly what that feeling is. Now somebody else can take a little bit of this. Like, of yes. course, I'm still going to shoulder some of it. Which is, so, and I, you know, someday, after the resurrection, and once our chemical imbalances are all corrected... I I would like to understand from him what it looked like sitting in his brain, like behind his eyes, observing life through the lens of his behavior and how other people reacted to it. I honestly think, well, clearly there was some mental illness. He was depressed mm -hmm. um, and, and probably some other things going on which I, I personally totally understand. Mm -hmm. But I just got the impression that he was running from something in his own life and the way that he dealt with whatever was going on. Do you, do you remember the way he would talk and interact with people? It was kind of like he was on a sitcom. <laughs> I do remember he was constantly trying to be jokey, which in an atmosphere where missionaries are essentially always trying to create a reverent atmosphere where we can bring in the spirit or, or invite the spirit and we can teach, it it was miserable yeah. with him like trying to create that because yeah. he was just always trying to break it up and basically trying to draw attention to himself. Like he told the I was the homecoming king story constantly as if that was like social currency. Yeah. To the point where it's like, Dude, these people have no idea who you are and may not have enjoyed their high school experience. Like, you being the homecoming king may not mean anything to them. Well, when there's a stranger, they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the impression that I got from him. It, it always felt like he was trying to set up a joke on a sitcom. Yeah. You know, the way he was talking to me, the way he would just phrase his sentences. And I feel like the weird part to, is he was always doing this. <laughs> He was like such a Chris Farley, like kind of oh, wannabe, kind yeah, of knockoff. Kind of like that. But it's it's like in public, if his jokes fell flat, he would be the only one laughing at him, and everybody just roll their eyes and whatever. In private, if his jokes fell flat, it would trigger him into just like fits of rage and all sorts of crazy things that was just so bizarre. Like it's, when he threw that chair at me. <laughs> you were. The, that was during your companionship, right? I wouldn't doubt it. I don't have a specific I memory of it. As you were Jensen, but we had not gotten into an argument that had a disagreement about something. You know, and I was still, at that point, very calm and measured. And, like, just didn't let stuff get to me. But we disagreed about something, and it made him mad. So Thompson and I left. It was towards the end of the day. <laughs> he picked up a chair and threw it at the door as we were walking out. That sounds about right. Yeah. He's Which is too bad. I mean, you got, I guess you were there for the six, the first six weeks that I was with him, because I was with him for three months. You got transferred out. Smart got transferred in. President Cameron had asked me in, like, the interviews leading up to that transfer, like, what I felt, whether I 
you know, wanted to stay with him, how I was feeling, because Coombs only had six weeks left, so it was like, he's going home, let's just try to kid him on the freaking plane, and I told him I didn't want to do it, because I was already stressed out of my mind with this kid, partly because when I got transferred to the beach view, it was also the first time as district leader, so I was just trying to figure out how to even do this, tape reports, and what is that, and Traft is right there, and he's like, He's, he's mentoring me as far as being my zone leader and trying to help me figure out how to be a district leader, but he's also trying to be my friend because he understands I'm, I'm in, like, Hurricane Katrina over here with this guy. Yeah. And when Smart got transferred in, I remember President asking me before transfers whether I want to stay with him. I'm like, no, I don't. And he's like, are you willing to pray about it, whether or not you should do this? I'm like, totally. So I, it was like a week before our next meeting. Um, and I, and I, I prayed about it, and I, I tried. I tried to be a, keep an open mind, and I tried to you know ask for strength if that's what he wants to have done. But I still felt when I went back to meet with Cameron, like I didn't want to do it, and like there was no reason like I needed to do it. Like I'm out here to serve a mission, and not to babysit this guy exactly. because at the time I just didn't understand my call really I just I thought I'm not going to teach and screw this crap and then Cameron I, I told him he's like how do you feel about this and I told him all that and he and he was basically just like the guy's got six weeks left and you're not the only one that suffered and <laughs> I, I need you to do this and as I start tearing up and I'm just like okay he's just like tell you what this is unorthodox but why don't we split the time up? And so, I don't know if it's ever even been done before. What happened is, because he knew, uh, you know, Treft and, I guess, Smart was getting introduced into the situation, but he knew Treft knew Coombs really well, so he's like, we're going to take the next six weeks on a round robin where you're going to spend a week with Coombs, and then you're going to go to Brookline, and either Treft or Smart is going to come and spend a week with Coombs, mm -hmm. and then whoever wasn't just with Coombs that week is going to come the next week, and so for, for the next six weeks, you're only going to be within two weeks. And it was bizarre. And funny, too, because Treft, like, I don't understand how a human can just be so, I guess, kind of just confidently... Um, singular from other humans. Like, Treft doesn't get bothered by other people's attitudes. He doesn't get, at least externally, I don't know, he's just, and with Coombs, he would laugh at most of it. Like, yeah. things getting thrown at him, like all the curse words and stuff. He just laughed it off genuinely. And I was like, you're, I don't, like, smart? <laughs> I think he just played it cool, but he was annoyed. He just kind of was, like, quietly annoyed about it. But I've always wondered if you had stayed and you had, like, been in that situation. Like, how, how do you think you would have handled that? Well, I didn't have to handle it more than once a week. Yeah. Uh, maybe, I guess, twice because we were at church. Yeah, yeah. But <clears throat> in between, I just didn't worry about it. And <laughs> it, it was somebody else's problem. And <clears throat> I know that <laughs> on P-Day, it could go either way. Do you remember what we did on P-Days? Like, I feel like I was just so stressed about it that I don't remember activities. Like, did we play basketball? Did we take trips into the city? Like, um, I know we hung out, but I don't know what we did. I can't remember fun times. I don't remember if you were there yet or not. We did go to this... I don't think you were, because... Um, we went to... We went into the city um, a couple times. We went down to... Uh, Little little area across from Washington Incline. Okay. Um, and we went to the Hard Rock Cafe for my birthday. <laughs> I, got, I got permission from President Cameron to do that. So we did that one week. That's amazing. Yeah, we did the inclines a couple of times, I think. <clears throat> um, and yeah, we went into the city, the city proper, once or twice, you know, when people were getting together, like, and playing soccer. Yeah. Um, kind of like university, I think. Wow. Mostly, though, we hung out around the apartment. Screwed around. I remember. It might, I, it might not have been when you were there when we did the uh, the gallon challenge. I remember that. Were you there? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I've got pictures of Elder Martin trying, being so close to finishing the Twinkie challenge. <laughs> I mean, I think he was one or two Twinkies away, and then it all coming back. <laughs> and I wasn't growing, like, I don't do vomit at all. I 
I cannot do puking. But in that moment, I wasn't upset by the vomit. I just remember thinking, oh, it looks like pancake batter. <laughs> it really would, wouldn't it? I think I got pictures of it somewhere. I mean, total sidetrack at this moment, then. You are a relatively new father. How's, how's all those instincts feeding she into... She doesn't do much of that yet. Thank no? Me. Yeah. <laughs> I can do all of the other stuff. My wife and I have a deal. I'll do the blood. <laughs> if there is ever any of that. And then, you know, kids get hurt, right? They yeah. Fall down and you, just, you do something. <clears throat> I'm, I can handle all of that just fine. I just can't do puke. <laughs> uh, actually, the the night she was born, for the first time in our in, in her whole pregnancy, Rachel got real sick, and uh, I'm just <laughs> holding <laughs> holding the bucket oh. and looking away and trying to like cover my ears so I can hear it. Oh, <laughs> it's so hard for me. Like that's <clears throat> the, that's. Probably the best husband anybody could be. What you just described there, like to have that issue and to be like, I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna be here. I'm gonna be where I need to be. And I'm just gonna try not to get triggered by this thing. Yeah, I'm very much a sympathetic puker. So that's that right there is my Achilles heel. It's <laughs> puke. So where did you go from Brooklyn? Uh, Indiana. How long were you there? Those are four, four and a half. How many companions? Two. Over there was first, and uh -huh. I just about killed him. <laughs> um, and then Stanquist for three months. Heard the name. Um, <clears throat> that's like a rural area, right? Like that's kind of yeah. Like there's there. a small university there. Oh, that's right. But it, okay. it is a small community. Mm -hmm. The we were in a branch. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> You know, if 30 people showed up, that was a lot. Did you have an actual church building, or did you yeah, guys just meet yeah, somewhere? Yeah, we had a building. Oh, okay. <clears throat> regular size building, but <laughs> it kind of seemed like a waste. Because, like I said, if 30 people showed up <laughs> to church, that was a lot of people. So you guys were doing a lot of, like, doing the, you guys were just doing the sacrament. You guys <laughs> spoke a lot. Like... Week, a lot of speaking, a lot of teaching, <laughs> you know, gospel doctrine. And this all while trying to corral our crazy eternal investigator. Uh, the guy had, I didn't realize it at the time, I wasn't that aware, but this guy had some serious mental illness problems. Oh, wow. And he was always back and forth, um, you know, with his interest in the church and trying to be pulled into this other church and so on. But <clears throat> that was an interesting time. And in the dead of winter, Oh, wow. Those areas are, are rougher yeah. when covered in snow. <laughs> we didn't um, did do a lot of track tank. <laughs> <laughs> that, those, that's hard. Where was I when we went tracking one day? And the houses, I mean, it was actually like a rich, you know, a place where rich people build their houses way off in the middle of nowhere intentionally. And we were walking like probably like 200 yards mm -hmm. between houses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was just like, is this productive? Are we really? Because most of them weren't even home. Because why would a rich person be home at like yeah. 11 o'clock on a Wednesday or whatever? <laughs> like, just ridiculous. Um, so, you, Indiana, then where'd you go from there? Um, I went to Jamestown. That's so, way up north. Mm -hmm. That was with um, Scalgard. Heard the name. Um, was he the one that was always hanging around? Hancock? Uh, yeah, I think he and Hancock were pretty tight. Okay. He seemed like a nice enough guy. I'm he not was sure. Cool. <clears throat> we had a so there were there were three missionary sets in the was that our whole zone? That might have been our whole zone, I don't remember. But it was <clears throat> it was us. Um and he was the DL and uh uh Linford and Eden were the other companionship and they lived a half a block from us <laughs> <laughs> why uh, uh, the sisters were uh, a couple miles uh -huh. in another direction so that's Jamestown New York I I feel like the farthest the two farthest north areas I was in was Meadville and Kane Kane was a little bit more north and just way more off to the east 
But somehow in one of those areas, I have a memory of getting to Lake Erie. Like, I've seen it. Mm-hmm. Does that mean that Jamestown is... Was that... We were even farther the, north than, than Erie. Oh, okay. Erie, Erie was um, like a good hour away. Wow. No, I think we went there once. On the companionship exchange or something one day. I don't it's a great name for that lake. Like, it's dreary. It's a yeah. <laughs> really, like, like, not... Your soul doesn't feel clean <laughs> around there. Like it's like really, it's a lo- like loads. Well, and I didn't, we didn't, I didn't get a positive impression of it because <laughs> again, that was like late spring or, or, or late winter, early spring, and it was still super cold. Yeah, around Lake Erie. So like just windy, Ugh. but that was fun. Sucks. Just to, just to kind of touch here. Yeah. <laughs> Blosser was telling me a story about his first night in the mission where. He started in um, Olean, which I don't know the areas very well, but apparently that's just way up there. And the guy who was his companion had been in the area, and they're driving back up, and he just wasn't paying attention or whatever and missed the turnoff, and they end up at the Canadian border, and the guy's just like, all right, we're going to let you turn around now, but you need to get out of here. <laughs> they would have had to go a lot farther, because you got to go all the way up think, yeah. through Buffalo to get to like the your border. <laughs> Yeah. And Buffalo was another like three and a half hours away from Jamestown. <laughs> so you really gotta not be paying attention to what you're doing. <laughs> That's a long ways. That's a long ways. Um, so how long were you in Jamestown? Six weeks. Oh gee. <laughs> that feels like you get up there, you get unpacked, you do your thing, and all of a sudden it's like, all right, pack back up. Get, I liked get back down here. I like Scalgard. I like Linford. And um, Limpert's a stud. I didn't know him like personally, but and just teasing the crap out of Eden, <laughs> um, playing pranks on the sisters. Which sisters were out there? Uh, it was um, Sarity. I'm seeing her interview. Huh? And uh, ask her about the tarantula. Okay. And uh, her companion was Sister Christensen. Oh, I remember vaguely her, <clears throat> the sweet person. I think. Uh, Quiet. We didn't have anything to do in that area. <laughs> our our area, Scalgar and, and my area, was so small it could be tracked out completely. And if that's what you did every day in three weeks, <laughs> it was dead. <laughs> and we we just we didn't even bother tracking because it was you know, hey, sorry, we knocked on your door a month ago. Are you interested now? No. <laughs> <laughs> so we played pranks on the sisters and we, we did what we call hockey contacting we'd go to the ice rink and watch the people skate <laughs> we, gosh we wasted so much time <laughs> which isn't necessarily a bad thing I remember when me and Haroldson got to Kane first of all it's like a four hour drive up there so we're just talking the whole time he's telling me about being from Idaho and farm equipment and all this stuff and <laughs> super just, exciting just to, but like just a funny, giggly, like, just a really sweet kid. Like, I enjoyed the time that we had together. And when we were talking on the way up, like, I basically, I, I was with Coombs for three months and just trembling. Like, as, we, as I put him on the plane, <laughs> like, I was just completely shaken and tired. And then Cameron, before he went home, his last thing, like, call to me was trainer. Mm-hmm. And so he gives me Salo, and so I'm just... Running on fumes. I'm just trying. We're out every day. We're just knocking doors. It's 14 degrees outside. Like, mm-hmm. I'm just doing everything I can to give this kid a good experience. I'm with him for six weeks. End of the six weeks, I get transferred up to Kane with Haroldson. So, on the way up, I'm just dead. I'm dead inside. I hate everything. And not why I hate everything. I'm just really, really tired. And I want to be a good missionary. And I just don't even know what I'm doing anymore. And so, on, on the way up, like, me and Haroldson are talking, and he's talking about his experiences and stuff. And we basically come to this agreement. We're like, let's not treat this area like everything we've done up to this point. Let's try to just, like, get out of our... Get out of our rule books. Mm-hmm. Get out of the, our head of, like, this is what you have to do to be a missionary. And let's just, like, try to be creative. Let's figure this place out. So, a lot of days, we'd spend, like, the first... I don't know, a couple hours of the day, or maybe sometime in the afternoon after lunch or something, go into the rec center and play ping pong. Mm-hmm. And these freaking teenagers would just watch us, like, up against the wall and stuff, and we're just, like, <laughs> smoking across the table ping pong each other. 
And weirdly, like, I think it opened doors. We would go down to the main drag because it's just such a small town in just nowhere Pennsylvania. So we'd go, like, since we didn't have to be home until, like, 9.30 or something, we'd go to the main drag at, like, 8.30, and we'd just walk around mm -hmm. and talk to the kids and talk to the drug dealers and talk to <laughs> whoever. Just like, hi, yeah, we're here. And there hadn't been, we got whitewashed in. Like, they had scissors, and then it was empty for, like, three months, I think, and we got put up there, so... I mean, we had some success together. It was fun. But, yeah, like, in those types of areas, you just got to do it different. You yeah. got to think outside of the Well, and I think at that point, I think uh, Scalberg had another six weeks, maybe, after after we left. Oh, wow. And he was clearly just out of gas. He was done. <laughs> and I don't, I don't remember who he had been with before or what had happened, but he was done. So. You get the view totally like, he, effective. he was with... I feel like there was a few guys that were with Nelson that oh, I ended probably. up hearing stories about where it was just like, because because he was lax across the board like the whole time. If he got with another missionary who was also lax, like, things would, would get. I remember if he was with Nelson. Do you remember Nelson and Baker together? I think I heard about it. Baker was in Jamestown for a long time. Yeah. And he'd drawn on the walls with messages. Just standard <laughs> Baker stuff. So, wow. Six weeks and we got doubled out. <laughs> um, so at this point you're in, where did we leave you in? What was last Jamestown. Area? You're in Jamestown. Where do you go from there? And how far is this into your mission when you hit Butler? Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Barely a year, I think. Really? It's a lot to happen. So Butler, I was in North Hills. Butler was just the one north of that? Um, or was it like next to Cranberry? Like, I think it was northeast of Cranberry. Oh, so further that way then. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I got put with Evans, Brandon Evans. <laughs> and within uh, 10 minutes of us driving back to our area, we were best friends. <laughs> just like that. Because I remember we were... We were trying to decide where we were, we were going to eat on the way home. And we were going to Rochambeau for it. And we threw the same thing seven times in a row. And we're just looking at each other. We're like, what? Yeah, we, we told like each other. Like, like, do we exactly. just become best friends? That I was, think so. <laughs> and we started talking about, you know, comic books and martial arts and all this, all the stuff that we were into and anime and blah, 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 blah. How long were you there then? <laughs> Six weeks. Wow. Because he was having um, sleep problems. Like, and I think he still does to this day. He, he could not wake up. And it's not like, oh, I don't want to get up. He, he, I would drag him off his bed and like, Kick him in the gut, or flick, flick his his feet, and like smack him around, and he just wouldn't wake up. And wow. so that made it hard to you know get up and hold to a schedule. And uh, we got up one morning, and it was kind of late. Uh, we didn't get right up right at six thirty. I think it might have been eight, and I had just gotten in the shower, and he because I couldn't get him up. Yeah, like I knew he wasn't in any sort of medical danger. He was fine. He just, yeah. Had trouble. So I got up, I got in the shower, and while I was in the shower, the AP showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and I no, no, this is over. So we got, <clears throat> at the end of the transfer, we got. Oh, they like blamed it on your companionship? They were like, oh, these two are too relaxed around each other. Who were they? Which, which set? I don't remember. I don't think Treff was an AP guy. Who was that before him? And was it Prieto and. Maybe. No, I, I can't read until it after. Yeah, he was he was with Traps. Like, they were APs together. I was don't it, remember. Yeah. Was it them or was it the Zonier? Did we I have two AP, like, one companionship of APs at one time, and then when Crump came in, did he make two distinct, like, where the APs were a senior companion, and then they just carried around a junior companion? Because I was there with Smart during that time. Like, with the whole Lawson thing, they dumped me with... Smart for a couple of weeks until they could figure out what to do with me. And there was another. It might that have been Prieto. I don't remember exactly. Anyway. But now that you bring it up, 
It does seem like at one point there was a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah. Which arguably might have been a better way to clean up the mission. Probably and spread them with, around a little bit. <laughs> with Cameron having been an assistant to the president as a missionary, I mean, he's just like, we need more of these. Let's let's have more of these to send around. <laughs> yeah, so we we were there, and we had two apartments, actually. Two physical different we residences? Had two full apartments that belonged to the church. And you could just pick whichever one you felt it's like staying? Well, initially we were in we were in one that I actually liked better because it was it was in this older apartment building that was made all out of concrete and cinder block. Wow. And there was nobody below us. There was a hallway on one side and the outside of the building on the other side. We could do whatever we wanted in that apartment and nobody could hear a thing. <laughs> but Baker had been in that apartment too uh-huh. and had ordered like 12 different magazine subscriptions. <laughs> Sports Illustrated and Maxim, <laughs> and I mean, he had, there were stacks and stacks and stacks of magazines. It was, it was a mess, and he, oh, he's so gross. You know those, those popsicle molds that yeah. you put in the freezer? Uh-huh. He took a dump in it, <laughs> wrapped it up in a plastic bag, and labeled it Poopsicles, and put it in the freezer. <laughs> It was, st- it was still in the freezer. Where we- I mean, for those of you watching and or listening, like, that sounds disgusting, but that's kind of par for the course with Missionary yeah. World as far as the way you guys, the things you don't see, like what happens when you go back to our apartment. Like, in my first area, we weren't, me and my trainer weren't a huge fan of doing the dishes, and at some point, <laughs> it became a game to see, like, how artistically the mold would start to, like, build on stuff. <laughs> It was pretty gross. It's the sort of thing that's really funny from the outside, right? <laughs> but when you're the one who has to clean it up and get it out of the freezer, uh-huh. <laughs> it's not as funny. <laughs> you know, and I had... Baker was in... Baker and Nelson were, were together in library when I was in Brookline. Okay. So I had been exposed to them already, and I, like, I knew who they were. <laughs> and they were kind of funny. But you also knew this guy <laughs> was nuts. <laughs> so when I got to that area and saw that, I, I kind of wasn't surprised, <laughs> but I was a little annoyed. Just a few cuss words in a trash <laughs> bag, you're like, whatever, this, this is life. <laughs> so when they pull out Evans, who did they give you after that? Gillespie. He's a quiet dude, right? Like he had those little thin frame glasses and... Mm-hmm. That was one of the most trying companionships of my mission. I really, really struggled with him. Because he could be, I don't know if he's this way now. Like, I've only talked to him once since then, and that was at the last reunion. Uh-huh. He could kind of be condescending and difficult. And I was, I remember the, like, the turning point where I, I, I just could not, I could not do him anymore. I was, I was the driver in that companionship. And you, you remember we had to have a backer, right? Yeah, to somebody, uh-huh. somebody help you back up so you yeah. didn't run into something. Uh-huh. Which, in all fairness, is for a 19 smart year old, thing to do. So smart. Yeah. Because the church does not like it when you wreck one of their cars. And boy, boy did we. I still, it still hurts my heart to think about, I guess it was Christensen had, like, destroyed the axles on a car... And the way they chose to solve that problem instead of like replacing the car or fixing it is they gave it to Sister Cameron and then just gave him another <laughs> car. And I'm like, that's our mission mom, bro! Like, ugh, gross. Anyway, anyway, so I'm I'm backing up the car. You know, I'm, I've got my arm over. I'm, I'm watching him. Yeah. For signals. Yeah. How close am I to this car that is behind us? Yeah. And I'm just looking at him. <laughs> and he's sitting there like this. <laughs> watching something and I tap the car behind us oh. like I'm, I'm being really really careful yeah so you know we were going real slow <laughs> I tap the car behind us I throw it back into drive and I pull forward and I put it in park and I get out I'm like what are you doing <laughs> I was looking at the tire <laughs> 
really good impression too. It, it took <laughs> everything inside of me <laughs> not to just totally lose lose my cool on the street and like start <laughs> punching him. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> so I just I, I'm playing that in my mind and I'm watching how slowly you're just creep you're slowly creeping back to the and then you just make contact. Just, just a little tap. And I know the car's getting bigger in your rearview mirror, and you're like, I'm a, you know, I'm not an expert on physics, <laughs> but <laughs> like that. we're really close. <laughs> yeah, so I called Ramsdale and told him what was going uh, on. And I think two days later, they they pulled me out and moved me into the office in the middle of the transfer. I imagine you were close to Ramsdale. Like, were you? Not the whole time. In fact, it was. I don't think it was until that companionship that we started to get close. Because, like, I was, it was obvious that I was having a tough time yeah. by that point with, with companions. He seemed to be drawn I mean, to missionaries like that. That were just good dudes, but yeah. just not in a good space at the moment. Yeah, so that's when they put me in the office. Do you think he was instrumental in that? A hundred percent. Wow. A hundred percent. Did you go home from the office? No. Oh, okay. How, how long were you there? I don't know. Four months, something like that. Because it was from there. Then you must have spent your last six weeks just somewhere. Because you and I were in the office together mm -hmm. during that period. And I was only in there for a couple of weeks until they put me a sense in it. And that was my last six weeks before I went home. So you must have... Is that how that worked? <clears throat> no, I, I got out of the office like... Uh, Six months before the end. But you came out in April, is when you came to Pittsburgh? And I came in October. Was, that makes sense. So that I, went, makes I went sense. in okay. mid-transfer and then left mid-transfer. Ramsell got you emergency transferred into the office? Because yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was serious. Like, if uh, something's got to change, I'm going to push this kid out of the window. I, I, I cannot handle him anymore. You know, I'd had some, I'd had some difficult companions before. Like, I mean, that's a lot Falter considering you've yeah, Kent Coombs had already been in your life at this point, and you weren't his companion. But I mean, we were we were one hundred percent oil and water from the very beginning. We just it was not. Happy. What did they have you doing in the office? It was the fleet coordinator. Oh, so you were like Ramsell. You were just mini Ramsell. Did you do much? It? I loved it. I didn't necessarily uh, love being with. Uh, Longberg. That was another difficult. I vaguely, I know the name. I, I don't know the person. Do you remember? The Wait, he was this? a tall, skinny guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was from. I Canada. was in a threesome with you guys for yeah. like a minute. Yeah. I'm talking about music in the car and him getting so <laughs> mad that we were talking about music. I feel like we even listened to a little bit. It was there. Probably. So <laughs> we might have. We might have tried to sneak a CD in. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Who else? So it, when I first went in, it was it wasn't Malmberg, it was um, Elder Woodbury, okay, and uh, Elder Walters, okay, and then I was on with Walters for like a month maybe, and Woodbury for a couple of weeks because that was the end of the transfer. He got transferred out, yeah. and Malmberg in to be the secretary, mm -hmm. and you know Elder Walter and I had become really good friends when I was in. Greensburg, or yeah, in, in, in Indiana. Indiana, okay. You know, we're pretty tight. <clears throat> so that was good. But then he got transferred out, and that's when we started getting, like, you came in for a yeah. short time, mm -hmm. Crimin came in for a short time, mm -hmm. um, towards the end. And I th want to say there might have been some other people, but I don't, I don't remember for sure at this point. Here's a weird question. Um, do you... Do you have a pretty visual memory for like the apartments? Like, do you mm -hmm. do you think you could probably find them if mm. you or or the basic areas of them? I've tried a couple times on Google Earth. Yeah, yeah. and some of them I can. When we were in the office, no way, because we had like three different apartments when I was in the office. Because you you were in the Greenberg zone. Mm -hmm. 
a bunch of different times. And I was going through my stuff preparing to do this trip, and I was trying to basically just find information on where all the apartments were, because I want to go back mm-hmm. to all my apartments. And I, luckily, I wrote letters home, so they had the yeah. envelopes and the addresses were there. I don't have a record of where we lived in Plum. Do you remember? Were you ever, did you ever go to I that area? I was in Plum. I, I died in Plum. Oh! Actually. Do you know where the apartment is? Do you think you have a record of that? I mean, you don't have to find it at this exact second, but if you, like, dug around your junk tonight, like, somewhere. Would you, would you have that? Because that would be epic sure, if I could go I back there. I have all of my blue card names. Yeah, I was my hoping that I was smart enough to put because I do have them too, but I wasn't. Not, not a hundred percent sure that the address is on, still on them, but I probably have some letters. I, I might still have that information. I'll, I'll text you when I'm leaving or something to remind <laughs> you. That, that would make me so happy because that's the one I've got all the rest of it, and it's the one place where I just want to get that part of the documentary and be like. I went there, but I can't take you to that place. Uh, I just remember there was like that, there was a long road, like kind of this downhill sloped road that basically we walked down every day because mm-hmm. because the area was just that away. Mm-hmm. And I, I tried Google Earth and it just plumbed. It's all just flat. I'm, it's yeah. not happening. Can't find it. Uh, so you you went from the office to Plum? No, I went from the office to Franklin for two weeks. Okay. That was when I was with Salo. Oh, Okay. So now that we've arrived here, you are only there, you said two weeks. Two weeks. Um, if you just left the office, then that means everything that happened with me had already happened. I, yeah. You know what, come to think of it... Because you were there with us before Crimin was. Crimin was still with Malbert when I left. Hmm. Poor you man. weren't there when I went and saw Salo, though. Because we I went with um, Smart on exchanges... But you, I don't think you were there at that time. No, when I... When I remember I, the apartment there was weird. There was like this brick wall thing going on. And I was like, this is not sanitary. <laughs> yeah, this is strange. I remember, I, I remember about that apartment in, in Franklin. Mm-hmm. That we were on the second level. And we had a balcony. And we spent a lot of time sitting out on the balcony screwing around. <laughs> as much as we could, you know, like late fall. Because it was, it was cold. So, uh, I mean, amidst just the socializing in that area, like, I mean, did that ever come up between you guys? Like, what happened? It, the, the little of what anybody knew about what actually happened to me, though. Was that conversation in that threesome you had with Salem? What happened to me, Phil? Was that the... Why well, lost or got sent home? Oh. Um... I don't remember ever talking to Salo about that. I knew about all that happened because mm-hmm. I was still in the office. Yeah, you were in the office when and he I literally got pulled in. Like I remember they all walking in that morning to the office, and the monster was already there, mm-hmm. and looking at him, and the look I will never ever forget the look that he had on his face. He was as white as a ghost, and of course this was Chrome. Yeah, by this point. I think you walked in just after they got out of the, essentially, the disciplinary council. Like, right after they... Because, yeah, he was... He looked floored. Like he had been through the ringer. Yeah. Just drained and white and I remember sweaty. him... Like, I was standing, you know, in the office in kind of that back room. And I remember... I remember when he came in and President told him to go in the room. And then President grabbed Ramsell and Lowe. And I remember watching Elder Lowe... Elder Ramsdale and President Crump walk into this room and just being like, I'm not sure there's a room on this planet that I would like to be in less than that one. Like, and I love Elder Lowe and I love Elder Ramsell, and that's part of the reason. Like, there's no way I'd want to have that conversation with those men. Well, I didn't find out what had happened until later because obviously I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna ask Wasser mm-hmm. right there. Yeah. You know, we went, we went into the, went in, we went into our office and just started doing our thing. And yeah. I don't even remember who told me what happened. I think it was probably Ramsell. Later. That's fair, yeah. Um, but anyway, you thanks. never had a, any uh, conversations so. with Salo about it? I, I mean, that, so. how did he seem as a missionary? Because he must have been out... He was less than a year at that point, but he'd yeah, been out he was in a while. He was a lot younger than me. But he was done, too. He was really? clearly done. Mentally. I wonder why. I don't know. It could have been because Pullman was at the end. And I 
like he was ready to go. Um, so some of that might have rubbed off. Could have been the area. But again, there was nothing happening there. Yeah. We spent a lot of time at the uh, the Ward Mission Leader's house. Huh. I don't remember their names. It was this old couple. He was British. <laughs> Funniest guy. <laughs> loved him. We, we'd just go over there and hang out all day and watch movies. <laughs> That's where I saw the, the second Lord of the Rings movie. It was at their house. You know, and he's, <clears throat> he's out on the back porch shooting at, at gophers with his, with his rifle. That's Pennsylvania right there. And uh, they were the nicest couple. Though. You know, they have a silver neck fetus and stuff. That's, so where'd you go from flight, frankly? Uh, this must be your last Pleasant area. Pleasant Hills. Is that where you went home from? No. I went home from Plum. Oh, you said that already. Um, <clears throat> okay, Pleasant Hills. I Pleasant heard Hills of it. With Sansana. First. You were with Sansana? Mm-hmm. How did you enjoy the Sensina experience? At first, I Ganku Yag Sensina. <laughs> we got along pretty well. Towards the end, things started to fall apart. Um, Why? Something stupid. Something like an argument or something? Yeah. <coughs> um, but, I mean, overall, I really liked him. Did he ever get physical with you? And Maybe like, I instigated it, but like, he's a good wrestler. I know, I know, he could have kicked my butt. <laughs> <clears throat> no, it was him, and then I had Faulkner again. <laughs> Is that the worst? When you like, get a companion that you've already been with, you're like, what's going on? <laughs> I was certainly. <laughs> but it wasn't as bad the second time, because uh, AC had broken him. <laughs> um, and then I had... Sam Stoddard after that. Big tall guy, right? Big guy. Not Josh Stoddard. Josh was tall. Josh was, okay. I didn't know Sam, I don't think. Yeah, Sam Stoddard. And he and I got along like a room on fire. We had a, we, we got along really well. <laughs> um, and then, so we were together for six weeks, and we were going to finish together in that area because we came out at the same time. Okay. He might have been in my MTC group. I don't remember. Wow. Um, but then two weeks into it, Crump was... Uh, Crump realized that uh, we're both going home at the same time. <laughs> and he didn't want to whitewash the area, so I got put in with the Plum Elders, with Elder Call, and I don't remember his companion's name. He took my place. We just switched so that uh, okay. there'd be coverage. So I finished in Plum. Wow. I was the elder call. Oh, so you weren't there that long? Four weeks. Wow. Yeah, that's not, I mean, considering how quiet Plum is, like, four weeks is enough time to get the, I vaguely remember a few discussions with Sense, and I like, there just wasn't much. To we do. tracked it a lot in Plum. We, we worked hard that last four weeks. Yeah. But I was so tired. <laughs> what did that do to, like, your post-mission life to move around so much? Like, you moved around a lot. As a missionary, kind of uncommonly. I was in my first area, Catan, in Leechburg, for seven and a half months. That's almost unheard of, though. Yeah. That and I was with my trainer for six of those. Like, I sent him that's home, that's and then they gave me Hancock, and then they're like, okay, we're done with this. No more of you. Yeah, I always wondered what that was like. <laughs> I, the most, uh, the I'm going to tell more of the stories on this thing when I get there and I'm standing there. Hancock just was amazing. Like, he just, I mean, he calls himself the dude. And it just gets to a point where everybody starts calling him the dude because you could just get sucked into his persona. Like, we went maybe in the first week together to like this comic book or this collectible store, mm -hmm. and he bought this like 16 inch Evil Dead character <laughs> that like put in batteries, the thing would like talk and like do motions and stuff. And that thing was on top of the fridge the whole time we were together. Every time he passed it, he pushed the button and it would say something stupid. That's like, awesome. <laughs> like, uh, can I do, like get a load of my boom stick or just yeah. great lines for that movie. Uh, he, he went, he liked to go running at night uh -huh. and he had like a Walkman with like 
rock tapes and stuff. <laughs> so because of that, I was just like, screw this, I'm in. So I go to the Walmart or something, buy a Walkman, and buy Poison's Greatest Tapes. <laughs> and we, like, run every night. Uh, <laughs> it was, I, I acknowledge the disobedience, but we had fun. We would do work. He would, like, he treated tracting like, um, what's that freaking movie? Um, Super Troopers? Like, he uh, would just, like, try and see if he could say me out. So, like, this type of, that's it. He just had fun with it. He never, and he taught well. I think, like, I, think I may have been there with him once on an exchange. Because <laughs> I, I remember that very clearly. It was fun. We, um, when he showed up, uh, I don't know if you remember Elder um, Crenshaw. Jonathan Crenshaw. He's from Nevada. I think he might live here now. He was just it sounds familiar. He was but... rich, so like he had like a Palm Pilot, and he was just you know yeah. his suits were yeah. kind of too clean and pressed. Like he was just a real kind of hoity toity dude. Um, Matthew Allred got transferred in at the same time Hancock did, and so they were over in Freeport. We were in. Uh, Leechburg and we'd you know hang out in P days and stuff like that. At some point, I think it was Matthew and and uh, Hancock's idea to have what we started calling match fights, where we go to the store and buy a 250 count box of matches, uh-huh. just strike matches. They had a two floor apartment in uh-huh. Freeport, and so like the bottom floor. Top. We'd go down to the bottom floor of this thing. We'd set couches on either side of the of the room as barricades. And if you light a match, there's a mo- there's like a flare moment where you have probably a good three seconds of a pretty hot thing. Uh-huh. If that contacts your skin, it sears right to it, yeah. and it just and it burns and it's awful. And we just light a match and throw each other, and half an hour, the whole two fifty count box was gone, and just little sticks everywhere, and a little bit of smoke in the air, like <laughs> in uh, in Jamestown. I told you we were real close to the other missionaries yeah. in their apartment. So we spent most of the time that we weren't out was supposed to be working at their apartment. Like yeah. we do, you know, we do morning study there and we do all this other stuff. Well, they had their apartment was set up in this kind of strange configuration. You walked in the door and there was a there was a living room up about the same size as this room. Uh-huh. Uh, the front door was over here. And then there was a, the divide. There was a kitchen on the one side, mm-hmm. and this little area that went around and up the stairs. Mm-hmm. So there was this, there was this medium narrow section <coughs> wall. Mm-hmm. Well, they had a set of golf clubs. <laughs> so we started out that six weeks playing a game, and I don't remember what we called it, but one person would stand by the door with the golf club, uh-huh. a golf ball, wiffle ball. <laughs> The other would stand against the wall, and you got two pillows, two, you know, couch pillows like this size. You could cover your face, and you could cover your junk. And we'd drive golf balls at each other. By the end of that six weeks, you got one hand, and you had to choose which one you were going to cover. And I'd never golfed before in my life. I couldn't fit for anything. It was terrible. Uh, the ceiling would, would disagree, though, because there were holes in the ceiling from our <laughs> back. So. But, uh, man, Linford could. And he drove one and nailed me right in the nipple. And, you know, you think a wiffle ball, right? That doesn't hurt. That's nothing. It's super light plastic. Yeah. That ball. At that distance, it stings, man. <laughs> it stings bad. <laughs> we screwed around. I remember this one morning, uh, Hancock, I don't know, I don't think he was into physical fitness, I just think he didn't want to go home, like, fat, he just wanted <laughs> to, like, stay in shape, yeah. and he, he had a, a set of those, like, push-up things, where mm-hmm. they're just, like, individual handles, and they just kind of, you know, and he would just, like, crank these push-ups, like, 50 at a time, and I'm just laying on my bed at one point, reading, I think I was reading a book about insane, I don't even know where I got <laughs> it, but I was reading a book about insane, and he's just cranking these push-ups, and one or both of the bars breaks. Oh. And he just like, just flat on the ground, just hits the ground. And I, it was great. Like, I, I would get the best laughs from him. I remember this one time, I just didn't know where he was. Like, it had been a while since I seen him. And I was just like, dude. And he was like, yeah. And he was coming from the bathroom, like down the hall and we're around the corner. I'm like, what are you doing? And I, I like look. I'm laying in my bed and I look around so I can see down the hallway and you can see the door of the bathroom. And like, 
<laughs> the the bathroom door, if you're looking at it, you can see the shower is mm-hmm. essentially that, and then what you can't see behind the wall would be where the toilet is, and then the sinks mm-hmm. opposite it against the wall. And like I'm expecting, you know, him to to tilt, you know. Yeah. Standing up and, and look at me and say something, and his head like pokes out, like he's on his hands and knees. His head pokes out from a, a really strange position, and he's like, "I'm narrowing my bummy hole, dude. What's up?" <laughs> and, and, and that started the conversation of, "I know what nair is, and I know what a bummy hole is. What are you doing?" <laughs> He just constantly was full of weirdness. This one time we got home, it was like 9.30. The phone rings, I pick it up, it's all red. He was just taking our numbers and stuff. And I'm sitting in a chair, and there's like a door from the kitchen dining room area here that feeds into this room, and then another door that goes off in the bedroom. And I'm just like talking to all red, and my peripheral picks up the dude standing right there. And I turn around, and like, he's wearing a shirt, he's wearing his tie, like it's loose, what have you. No pants, no bottoms. Just so he's all dude hanging Donald out Donald. there, just standing there like nothing's wrong. I'm just like, yeah, no, that that's part of the course. That's that's what the dude would do. It was six weeks of that, just madness, just all the more fun. Literally, I'll admit it, it's fine. He <laughs> maybe I'm, maybe I'm out in the deal. I'm just stuck in. He's gonna be like, don't talk about me when I'm not around. He. He had a he had a calling card, and he would call home mm-hmm. like relatively frequently, mm-hmm. like a a girlfriend or something back home. So because I was just impressionable at the time, I'm like, oh, I'll do that. So I bought a calling card, and I called the girl that I had last been going out with when uh, when I went on a mission. Like mm-hmm. we basically parted ways like the the night I got set apart, um, and I called her, and it was. It was one of those, like, sobering moments as a missionary where I just got so inside of the world that the dude builds Mm -hmm. that I didn't realize that other people had other priorities or other people saw things a different way. And I just didn't think anything was wrong with what I was doing because I was so deeply ingrained in this thing. And I remember her picking up the phone, and I was like, hi. And she's like, hi, who's this? And I'm just, I'm not expecting that. I'm like... And I'm, I'm, I have this big, like, shit-eating grin on my face because I think I'm about ready to make her day. Uh-huh. And I'm like, it's Adam. It's Adam Blaylock. And, like, probably ten seconds of silence. Uh-huh. And she's just like, why are you calling me? And it was just <laughs> a really dark conversation of her being like, listen, I don't know what's going to happen for the rest of our lives, and I'm not planning on anything right now, but, like, this isn't okay. Uh-huh. Like, focus. You're on your mission for the love of How long had you been out? Uh, I mean, at that point, seven months. Oh, man. Ish. <laughs> it was gross, and that was one of those moments where I'm like, okay, nope, done with that. No more of this crap. I think at that point, I even stopped running with him. I think he started driving over... I think we would drive over to Freeport, he'd run with all red, and I'd just hang out with Crenshaw until I got back. I'm like, nope, throw away the Walkman and the tape. Yeah. We're not doing this anymore. He was just, and it wasn't like, I don't consider Hancock a disobedient missionary. I just think he played by his own rules. He just, he had things he cared about, and he wasn't going to let anything else, like, deter him from that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why, you know, he probably got a reputation for being disobedient. I don't think it was disobedience. I think he cared about what he was doing. I think he came out for good reasons. Mm -hmm. He just also had his own agenda. Wasn't going to let anything make him different. Which I guess arguably is what missionary service is supposed to do. I think yeah. it's supposed to put you in a a sphere in a place where you you aren't gonna not change. Yeah. Well, I never I never considered myself a disobedient missionary either, but I certainly wasn't effective. And part of that, I was sick for most of my mission was with one issue or another. I got really bad bronchial infection, lung infection pretty early on, was sick almost the entire time that I was in Indiana. Uh, It just, it followed me around. And then I was having, you know, I was dealing with depression for a lot of it. It was early on, I realized, man, like, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to keep doing this, but I'm not really sure I want to be here. Wow. You know, and I went out super excited, or I thought I was excited. 
<laughs> like I thought I was going out for the right reasons. I thought that I was doing it for me. You know, in retrospect, that was not true. Um, and my trainer just pissed all over that green fire in a in a bad way. So that's wow. right out of the gate. I had a bad taste in my mouth for the whole thing. And I kept trying and trying and trying and faked it for a long time. But by the midpoint, even, like, in a lot of ways, I was done mentally. Like, I was. And, and there were a couple conversations with Crump that were like, well, look, I'll send you home if you want to go home. Like, if you're that frustrated with all of this and you're having wow. problems, you can go. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to go home. I'm not going to. Because I have friends that had, you know, had only yeah. out for six months or whatever. And I told them, I'm, I'm not giving up. I'm not going to. You know, even with all of the crap that's going on and all of the internal struggles and blah, 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 blah I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit on this because I committed to it. So I'm going to finish, even if I'm miserable. And I was. I was miserable. And I hated it. I was so excited to be home. But I'm glad that I did it. You know? Well, and Lawson and I talked a lot about this because he he doesn't feel great about his missionary service. He mm-hmm. thinks he could have been a lot more effective and he could have been a lot stronger like when he was with companions that were not doing the right things. Like mm-hmm. he who he is, like he could have taken control of that situation and he just didn't. And so he, he said a lot of the same things. He's like, oh, I just wish I would have done whatever. And, and our conversation eventually got to the point where I was arguing, like, on the basis that you were sent by your Heavenly Father, who knows, you know, your talents and, and your interests and all that sort of thing, and, and also knows his children and the place that you're living, like, on the basis of that, it's kind of impossible. We, we basically got to a point where Lawson made a really interesting point where he was just, like, he was talking about how, before I got to Meadville, he was there with another companion and they were, there was all the messing around that was happening when I got there was happening then. And he said, when I got there, he, they, there was one person in our teaching pool, this name, dude named William. And he was on, on date for baptism. And what I didn't know until I talked to Lawson yesterday was they, him and his companion were over at William's house and just messing around. I think his companion was like watching a movie, just mm-hmm. totally unplugged. And Losser was over off to the side talking to William and teaching him. Mm. Just sort of out of character, just in his opinion anyway, but, mm. but I, I, I think completely in character for him. He was he was there, like, connecting to why he came on a mission and connecting mm. to this guy and really doing the thing. And as he's sitting there talking about how, you know, oh, uh, I could have done better and, you know, my mission was a failure and all this, I'm just thinking, no, it wasn't. <clears throat> like, you actually had the impact that you were capable of having. Basically, he made a statement where he was, when he told me about that story about William, where he was just like, you know, even God can just take a, a missionary that's just screwing off and, you know, isn't maybe worthy of that moment and still put it in them to do great things. And I was like, that right there defines your entire mission. That it doesn't matter how little you might have even necessarily been prepared for a certain moment. If... Just the fact that you're there, just the fact that you actually came on a mission, and to your point, the fact that whether it was miserable or not, you just devoted yourself to it and stayed, mm-hmm. God works with that and does things. Whether it's a baptism or whether it's just somebody that is brought a little closer to God, they just have a better opinion of spirituality or whatever because of the example that you were of a human being, I, I couldn't possibly look at your service any other way than that. That who you are totally impacted that mission. Well, you know, I had a, a similar conversation um, with Ramsell about that after I got home. You know, in the five short months between when I got home and when he died. Yeah. Um, and he said a lot of those same things because I was I was pretty rough on myself. Yeah. So I, you know, <clears throat> I was cognizant of who I was and my level of devotion and effectiveness in the mission field and I was really struggling with that and he 
he pointed out, you know, you can't be that hard on yourself about it because you were sick pretty much the whole time. You had something going on the whole time. So you can't blame yourself and think, man, I'm, you know, I'm just worthless and blah, blah, blah. I didn't do anything positive on the mission. <clears throat> you know, because I was part of two baptisms. No mission. Oh, wow. A, a couple. And Treff actually baptized them after I left in, in Brookline. Oh. The Derricks. Um, whoa, 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 whoa. Treff baptized the Derricks? Yeah. I'm seeing them in a few days, and I I feel like I just thought that they were like a newly converted family that all of us just got to know and got to love. Mm-hmm. I didn't know he baptized them. No, it wasn't after. It was st- I was still there. He baptized them, and I converted them. Or at least I did her. Was I there for that? He must have been. Oh, I, I can't wait to, to talk to them. <laughs> now. I, didn't, I don't remember this. <laughs> so I was part of that, and then I baptized the lady in uh, Butler. We wow. never got confirmed. She disappeared afterwards. Oh, that hurts. <clears throat> and so, you know, I come home thinking, that was a waste of two years of my life. I didn't do anything effective. I have a completely different view of people now. Yeah. You know, I was, I was very outgoing beforehand. Got along with everybody. Mm-hmm. And now I'm this super judgmental, closed off person doesn't like meeting new people, doesn't like humanity in general at this point. Wow. You know, this was not a good thing for me. Why did I do this? And, you know, he tried to talk me down off that ledge. Which is ironic because, and maybe one of the only reasons that he could have that talk with you is because that's exactly how Paul was with himself. Mm -hmm. Really hard on himself. And I suspect there were so many more things going on behind the scenes that even those of us that were really close to him didn't know. Yeah, which sucks. Because in a weird way, it's almost like even though we were just kids, a lot of us probably had a lot of experiences in life, a lot of tools that might have helped him. But because of, you know, the age range or just whatever, like he, none of us, he was so fun for all of us. Like he was close to all of us, but not many of us were close to him. Yeah, in, in a lot of ways that's true. And, you know, everybody had, I I don't know specifically from missionary to missionary what their relationship was like with him. You know, I know with Walters, Elder Walter, he, it was, it was a friendship. It was very much a friendship. He was much more of a father figure for me, Um, you know, because my dad wasn't, we, we never had a close relationship. Um, even though I lived with him in high school, we've never been real close. We still don't communicate all that much. So he was kind of like, he, he was trying to fill that role. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but that conversation that we had after, after I got home, and he came out a couple of times. Um, and even after that, I didn't, I wasn't convinced. And for, it, honestly, let's see, I've been home for 15 years now. Yeah. Um, in two months, it'll be 15 years. I thought, why? What did I accomplish? What was the point of all of that? Yeah. And if the, I can really only take away two things, and that's it's the relationships that I've built with other missionaries, the friendships that I made, some of them, being some of the most important to me in my life, even now, you know, like with, with Elder Evans, Brandon. Yeah. He's still my closest friend. He's still my best friend. Um, Sister Meisel is still a good friend of mine. And without her, I, I wouldn't have met my wife. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and maybe and I wouldn't have my baby, who was, yeah, as 100% my everything. And I can't imagine not having her. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I still go back and forth on the issue. If I could go back and do it again, would I? Well, I wouldn't have those relationships. If it weren't for those, I could definitely say no, I wouldn't have done that again. In the sense of the fact that I 
not having any children of my own, like I, I, I don't know that I can really relate to that feeling of once the child comes into existence, like you can't imagine existence without the child. Similar to what you said, I feel like a lot of my own feelings about my mission and, you know, would I do it again, come back to the fact that I, I don't know that I would want to see a world without those people in it. Mm-hmm. Like, just... I mean, I, it, like Hancock, we've talked maybe once since I've been home, and he's a nice enough guy, but regardless of our relationship <laughs> since the mission, his impact on me in just those six weeks, or even my trainer, like, mm-hmm. it creeps me out how little information I can find about that guy. I've been yeah. trying to find him for 15 years. There's a couple companions like that who seemingly dropped off the face. Yeah, and I'm just in, like, kind of a three Nephites kind of way. I'm just like, wait, what just happened? Hold on, did, uh, did, did, is that, did I just, did I just get mentored by an angel, and like, now he's just done, and well, he gets to go home? Like, I definitely happened? weren't. <laughs> <laughs> and, but as far as Ramsell goes, like, I guess my own Ramsell story, um, I, I loved him, like, when I was in North Hills, I think it was the first time I, I met him, um, he came to, like, fix the plumbing at one of the other elders' apartments, and so I, I met him there, and I started to get to know his, like, personality and stuff, and then when I was in Beachview, because mm-hmm. he was, he went to that ward, like, we'd see each other every week, and one of my favorite memories of him conversationally was, like, we were all just joking around about something, and somebody jokingly blamed me for something, and I was mm-hmm. just like, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, and he, like, leaned into me, like, put his arm around me and leaned into me and said, basically, just in my ear, as innocent as my dick. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was yeah. like, that moment to me is Paul Ramsell. Like he's, he's just that funny and awesome, but more personally, I guess, um, you know, after all the loss or stuff and, you know, I went to Plum and, you know, just kind of lived out, just sort of droned through the last six weeks of my mission. Um, you know, we got to the, uh, the transfer meeting and you know Crump had started doing that thing where he'd have all the missionaries that were going home stand up mm-hmm. and then you know we, they had already clap our hands it was yeah, all yeah. based on this scripture in Alma about people clapping their hands for joy at the, the thought of baptism and up to that point I thought it was a really sweet tradition but I'm standing there with all these other missionaries that are going home and essentially disgraced. There's nobody in that room that doesn't have some just messy opinion about me, or at least has heard a rumor or something mm-hmm. like that. And so I'm just, you know, kind of tearing up, just thinking that this moment is not supposed to feel like this. And it, just thinking about how quick things can go wrong and just really not feeling great about things. And then, you know, they have all the missionaries go out into the foyer and line up, and they have all the, mm-hmm. um, you know missionaries that are leaving to go back to their areas walk down this line and you know handshakes and give hugs and stuff to the departing missionaries and so most by that time i don't even know any of the missionaries in the mission because when you get old enough like all the new kids come in and you just don't know them so at some point you're just you just feel like a foreigner like this isn't your mission anymore and you don't care not at all not even a little bit they're all just like i saw you at a zone meeting once Uh uh-huh they're like oh so jealous i'm like don't be (laughs) get out of here go to the mission and then on down the line comes Paul Ramsell, like shaking everybody's hands and stuff like that. And he gets to me, and he shakes my hand, and he pulls me in for a hug. And he says in my ear as he's hugging me, I'm so proud of you. You did such a good job. And like, I mean, I guess you'd have to understand, there's a, there's a bigger picture here. Like, my last interview with Crump sucked asshole oh, yeah. like he was not like, he happy was with me as a person like i'm one of the reasons he actually shut down the whole going back to an area to baptize somebody stuff like uh-huh. he just was not okay with me as a human whereas your last interview with your mission president is supposed to be something along the lines of hey what are your plans when you get home hey that sounds great oh good yeah. luck and stuff our last interview was just like cool well see you around like it just sucked and so i'm leaving yeah. that and just hating myself for everything and then Paul Ramsell just, he gives me 
the only thing that I've been able to take with me for the for the last fifteen years as any sense of a, of a guy who could who could get it, a guy who could understand what happened and, and who I am and all that, to pick me back up and tell me that it's okay. And it's to the point where like when I die. I acknowledge, you know, my mom and dad will be there. There'll be a lot of ancestors and stuff like that. But just for nostalgia, there's just a part of me that wants Paul Ramsell to work his way through that crowd and give me a big hug and tell me that he's really proud of me and that that I did a great job. Because weirdly, based on that experience, like there's just nobody else I think that could tell me, you know, what I did in a way that would mean something to me, you know. That's the kind of guy that he was. I remember going to his funeral and, you know, Heather Bellarts was <laughs> losing her mind and Brandon was barely on the planet. Like, I, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't cried like that before that point and not since that point in my life. <clears throat> that event affected me more than just about any other thing I think in my entire life and I I never dealt with it to this point because I don't know how I, I, I genuinely don't know how to deal with that I don't know how to move past it and there's still a part of me that's really angry about it really angry with him about it um, because of the nature of our relationship you know I guess like feeling abandoned. Oh, it's he, definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and it definitely affected the way that I view. Because you weren't the you weren't in a good place already. Yeah. When that happened, so yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh. So. You know, I, I approached that uh, the whole topic of him specifically and, and those memories with totally mixed feelings. Yeah. You know, a lot of a lot of people, and I think yourself included, have probably have been able to deal with that in a healthy way. And I, I certainly haven't. As well, much as I have, would like to, I haven't. <laughs> I, I mean, I might have the benefit of having some distance from it. Like, you know, I didn't talk when I got home or anything like that. We just had a few fun laughs while I was out there and then one very intimate moment mm -hmm. of a goodbye and then the next thing I heard was Heather mm -hmm. sending me uh, the, um, the announcement that he had passed and stuff and saying, get your ass up here. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, no, I, uh, I found out that same night. Um, cause the same night? Yeah. From who? Um, Elder Walter. Steve Cole. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, he didn't give me a lot of details, but he told me. And Brandon and I were living together at that point. He was my roommate. So you had to be the one to tell him? I had to be the one to tell him. Uh, I also, I don't know, did you ever meet Dahan? Yes. Tyler Dahan? Yeah. Um, he was in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. With Elder Chatterton, when I was in Butler with uh, Brandon. Okay. And they came over one night, and we were gonna do splits and blah 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 the next day. Yeah. Anyway, the three of us got real tight real quick. <laughs> yeah. So I had to call him. I, 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 had to, I had to tell Tia. I had to tell Brandon. <sighs> I called Dahan. He was still out on the mission. What? And uh, his companion started with a C. I can't remember his name. He was Canadian also. I mean, he, he and Malmberg were pretty much the same person. <laughs> Wouldn't let me talk to him. Would not let me talk to the hub. Dude, just... I argued with him for 20 minutes. What are you going to tell? What are you going to talk to him about? Like, you, not, you not know what's going on? In the mission, have you not heard? Does nobody know what's happened? What are you talking about? Just tell me. So I finally told him. Paul's dead. Hold on. So then I get to tell Ty what had happened. 
and I, I knew what happened, but I didn't. Uh, I'm not even sure when I found out details. Heather told me a long time after what actually happened, because I just, I just thought he passed. I, I, I think I'd heard he had health problems or something, and I just assumed that was it, and then yeah. she filled me in, and that was when my feelings about that changed as well as my perception of him. Like, all of my memories of Paul got kind of categorized differently, yeah. where I was like, oh, man. It, it shifted everything yeah. into a, a completely different sphere. Yeah. So that was that was not fun, um, having to tell some the people that I was closest to at the time yeah. about the death of somebody and else that we were to. all close to. Yeah. And it was, that was tough. I know, I can only imagine him and Tia were tight. Yeah, they were. Pretty, pretty close. I mean, as close as they could have been in, you know, in those circumstances. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, <laughs> with the whole story of your mission experience on the table, like, I mean, I guess you've already sort of talked a little bit about your takeaways, but um, I, considering that I, I have it in my heart that some of the people that are going to watch this documentary are going to be people preparing for missions themselves that are just like when before I went on a mission like I watched God's Army or you know I yeah. just tried <laughs> to find things that might give me an idea what it was actually going to be like and it's totally not that way <laughs> it's well it's like God's Army arguably condenses an entire mission into mm -hmm. like three days like that yes a lot of dramatic things can happen when you're out and a lot of super spiritual things happen but they don't happen in three days like you're going to experience that over the course of two years um but i mean what i don't know not something as cheesy as what advice would you give but like i don't know maybe there's nothing we can say like what 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 do you say to somebody who's about to embark on this thing and, and maybe you've already said it in the sense that like i, I love the way you described your dedication to stay even when it sucked like I don't know was there was there something that motivated you was there something that that kind of kept you going in those times like personal study or prayer or was there something no it was element? more of a refusal to fail in the eyes of you know my friends my family I, I'm going to do this so that I'm not ostracized when I go home because I know that if I go home early all of my friends who did go on missions and completed missions my dad whoever will look at me differently and I wasn't, wasn't going to have that and then some of it was just for myself to prove to myself that I couldn't do it that <clears throat> you know your life is going to have challenges and this is the one that I faced with right now so regardless of how I feel about the work uh, my current position whatever the world I'm gonna I'm gonna do this because I said I would do it that was really it I just I didn't want to fail I refused to fail uh, and you know you can <clears throat> you can say well and I, I have I have looked at it this way uh, myself. Maybe I did fail anyway because I didn't do I didn't do all the, the stuff that you dream about doing when you go on a mission. You know, you baptize a you baptize a hundred people or mm -hmm. whatever. I wasn't this great, fantastic missionary. Have I have I grown the way I thought I would grow? I don't know. Um, but I wasn't gonna quit. I think that was the big thing. It wasn't going to quit. I wasn't going to give up. Do you think that's served you since you've been home? Like, have you, has there been things you've been going through that you said termination sure. just kind of it, came back? It was the, you know, I didn't have a great childhood. We moved a lot. There was a, there was a lot of crap going on. Um, but that was the first time that I realized that regardless of what happened in my world I could survive I, I will survive no matter what happens I'm going to make it through certainly not unscathed but I will I can survive this whatever it is and that was the first time I think 
I recognize that that strength inside myself. It's going to suck, probably, but it's not going to kill me, so I'm going to keep going. Like, I'm hearing Kelly Clarkson in my head being like, what doesn't kill you makes you strong. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, that's... <laughs> You're 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 putting it much uh, more intimately than maybe her song does, but but maybe maybe that's what I'm gonna love when I look back at all this and I'm putting them putting the movie together about your story is that to some degree a mission just taught you uh, the value of resilience, the value of the end product of just being resilient and just letting letting something be hard and not backing off from that. Just, mm-hmm. just, just sticking at it. That's so rad. Well, dude, it means a lot to me that you would spend some time and sit down. Whatever, and, whatever we're going to do to get to hang out again and talk with you for a while. And <clears throat> talk about, uh, you know, there's a lot of that stuff. Like Brandon and I don't talk about that stuff ever. I don't think I talked about it with Tia. So, it's, it's nice to be able to talk to somebody who remembers that stuff but yeah. in, in the same way. And, and yeah, that's what Sarah was saying too. She's like, I mean, you can come over. I don't know how much I might remember about that. And and I did, I, I hit it hard with Losser, where a lot of his memories of areas he was in, our companions' names and stuff, were just gone. So, mm-hmm. it, one thing I enjoyed about this conversation is you are you are very good with like names and areas and members. And, I'm not like, anymore. I don't know why I, I can remember all of that stuff, <laughs> uh, but I can't do it now. I met a bunch of people yesterday when I was helping a friend move. I don't remember any of their names. <laughs> <laughs> not one. Uh, well, anyway, dude, uh, cool. this is awesome, and um, I feel like I want to try to make it back up here, like. At least once every other year, if not like once a year, Definitely just do visit it. and hang out. So we'll we'll keep hanging out and keep Come out and barbecue some more. <laughs> <laughs> I love your meat in my mouth. I can't. <laughs> Everybody does. All right, dude. Thanks. Sure. <laughs>